remember we said planting garlic is an exercise in faith because you stick it in the ground about three inches deep and in the spring it starts to sprout. Hello Somerville and welcome to our third season of raised bed gardening here at the Somerville Public Library. Um, we're doing a spring awakening today with our farmer Danny from Green City Growers. I'm going to turn you over to Danny. Hey everyone. So today for our awakening of the garden, what we're going to do is remove the salt marsh hay. Then we're going to work the soil a bit, turn it over and add some fertilizers to it. And then we are going to get planting. All right, so I'm just removing the salt marsh hay blanket that protected our soils over the winter. And now I'm just taking it off so we have space to plant and so we can get under there and work the soil. But the salt marsh hay is a good protectant. It can be even in the summer because what it does is it helps regulate the soil temperature, not necessarily only make it warmer. And it is also a great weed suppressant. So in the summer, even in the spring, there's lots of um, weeds spreading their seed. And if we didn't have this cover on, in the summer we would see tons of weeds. So this can be really good for a lot of different things each season. Um, but I really want to get under there and put some more fertilizer in the soil, so I'm just going to take it off. However, I'm not going to, you know, be really um, detailed and make sure that I'm taking all of it off because some of it will be really healthy organic matter to work into the soil as well. And hopefully we'll find some, you know, lots of earthworms in the soil that will help decompose it. It's pretty amazing the difference that the salt marsh hay makes um, with what you need to weed in the spring because for gardens and garden beds that I go to that haven't been covered over the winter, oh man, like the first spring visit is all just weeding for a long time and this we will barely have to weed at all. And I'm also ripping out a lot of mint uh, just because the mint really will spread all over your garden bed if you let it. Uh, so I am not being shy about just ripping it out where I don't want it because I know it'll keep growing. We also pruned these herbs in the fall and in the spring it's another good time to just go back and prune a bit more. And see these incredible mint roots. They're just so strong. And it's beautiful and smells delicious, but these roots really do uh, compete out other plants that we want to be growing that we're going to plant in here. So that's why it's important to just rip out the entire root where you don't want mint to grow. Okay, so we got all the salt marsh hay removed from this bed, so we are going to turn over the soil and add fertilizer. And we have these great irrigation lines, um, and to make it a lot easier, I'm going to just tuck these behind here so we don't have to be careful with them while we work the soil. And the fertilizer that I'm adding is a mix of Crayer's chicken manure and 
a granular fertilizer called azomite, which is A to Z of minerals. So it's just got lots and lots of micronutrients and minerals that the soil really needs. And it's a good balance with the Crayers because Crayers has a lot of NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, that the soil also really, really needs. Uh, so they're good complements to each other. And I'm gonna work the soil. It's quite wet right now. Ooh, I'm, but I'm seeing tons of earthworms already. Lots here too. This one really big one. So that's a great sign of the season ahead. It's amazing how heavy soil gets when it's wet. Oh, so here is a, a foe that I found, a garden foe. This, yeah, this is a beetle bug. If you find these in your garden, this will um, kind of haunt a lot of plants. And so I'm just going to squish this and hopefully um, find all of them and do the same. Just working in the leaves too in the salt marsh hay. So here we've got a really nice earthworm, just one of a lot I've seen already. You know, these are great because they're digging tunnels through the soil, which means that they're aerating our soil. And they're called the recyclers of the world because they just can eat so much. And their um, castings, their manure is amazing soil food working around the kale that overwintered, survived, and I actually um, snapped off a leaf and tried it, and it's really good. <laughs> so we're just gonna keep it and see how it does. I'm actually, what I'll do is I'm going to cut off the very top just to prevent it from completely flowering, and that way it'll keep producing leaves. There isn't, you know, there are perfect proportions to this, but what I like to do is kind of just see it evenly scattered on the bed and then I work it in. And um, crayers and azomite is what we're applying. And we don't really want it to just be sitting on top of the soil. We really want it to be in those first couple of inches. So I'm just working it into the soil. And now we can put the irrigation lines back. And I really like the irrigation lines laid out before I plant because they're just a great, um, reference of you know lines and rows will really help organize what you seed and plant so the first thing that we're gonna plant which is really exciting i think is potatoes and i brought three different types. This is a Katahdin yellow potato, and this is a red potato called strawberry paw. And then these blue purple potatoes are called harvest moon. And you can see that they're all, you know, different sizes and they've got different colored eyes. Uh, so this is a potato eye these growths where they start to sprout. And this is what we're gonna plant. This is a potato that we could eat, but we're gonna plant it. And we're gonna plant it eyes facing up so that when they grow, you know, they will grow reaching towards the sun. 
Um, and then they'll make a, a really beautiful plant and flower. And then when they start to wilt, that's when we know that the potatoes underneath are about ready to harvest. Another really fun thing about potatoes is to plant them, you really just need a part of a potato with an eye, not a full potato. So this potato has eyes all over it. These are the biggest, but these will definitely continue to grow. They're definitely eyes already. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to cut the potato in half And I'm going to plant with, I'm gonna plant this part of it facing up and then this part with these eyes facing up. And how you plant a potato is you wanna make a hole about an, a foot deep. The deeper, the better. And it's important to make it really deep because if it's too shallow, the potatoes will, they kind of rise a little and if it's exposed over the soil, then that's when you start to get that potato greening and then you can't eat it. Um, so wanna make it really deep. They will definitely reach for the sun and their sprouts will grow out of the soil. And if you don't have a really deep space what you can do is plant them however deep you can and then when the plants start to sprout mound and just add more soil over it so i put it in there and now we just cover it up um, but i'm actually going to leave it uncovered until i plant all the potatoes because i want to space them out about 10 to 12 inches apart from each other. And I don't know, I'm not a, I don't know the exact number, but it's something like from one potato, you can get three new potatoes. And I think that's a little um, conservative. I'm sure, I feel like you can actually get more than that, but. All right, and so to finish up this bed now, what we can do is um, do the sugar snap peas. So I left space so that we can get a really nice crop of sugar snap peas. And these are sugar snap peas that we're going to plant in the back. They're really big, pretty cool looking seeds and they'll germinate and um, climb up this trellis. And so how I'm seeding them is just placing one about every two inches, inch and a half, all along the back. And then they'll end up being about an inch deep. And this is great because they should be in full production mode. We should be harvesting them by the time, like right before we plant cucumbers and tomatoes. Um, so whenever we get the cucumbers and tomatoes, we will have already had some sugar snap peas and we can kind of put those crops in between or we can get rid of the sugar snap peas because they'll be on their way out anyway and make room for more summer crop. There we go. Okay, and so with our sugar snap peas and our potatoes and our garlic, this bed is complete. So what I'm doing now is I am soaking the kale transplants in this um, fer liquid fertilizer called Terra Vita. 
And usually I would soak it with uh, fish emulsion and seaweed diluted in water, but this is also already diluted, the Terra Vita, um, but the beds are really wet, so I just want as much liquid nutrients as I can get without more water. Uh, so I'm just dunking them in this for now, and we are planting in the second bed that's going to be kind of like our greens bed. And we're planting things that will tolerate shade because um, these beds get really good sun, but not for a really long time. So they need to be able to tolerate shade. And kale, you know, all of these plants love the sun, but um, kale will definitely tolerate more shady, more shady light. We're gonna have like a kale corner with three different types of kale, which I think is always really fun to do, um, to just have one crop, but different varieties, because it's just pretty amazing how diverse vegetables are. Um, and a lot of times we don't really, well, I don't always even know that there's as many varieties as there are. So here we've got the Lacinto kale or the dinosaur kale that we planted last season. And this is just green curly kale or winter boar kale. And then this is like a purple-ish kale that's called scarlet kale. Ooh, I don't even know what this is. Oh, this is, this is a caterpillar that we also don't want in the garden bed, so I will have to squish this, this plump guy. I guess last year we had a problem with leaf miners, and those are bugs that will mine into the leaf of the beet, and they will be in between the sides, just eating it from the inside. And there isn't too much that we can do about that to prevent it. Even, although we could do beneficial insects, like green lace wings are really good. Um, but it's another squishing remedy. Whenever I see it, I squish it. And the silver lining with beets is that even if they destroy the leaves and we can't eat those, even though they're really good to eat, um, we can still get the beet root. So we're gonna give it a go, try the beets again, and see how they do this year. So more greens that tolerate shade well are bok choy does really well and lettuces and beets will tolerate the shade. I'm gonna dunk these quickly. I'm saturating the soil plug, but um, it's okay to get it on the leaf too. And how I'm planting it, I usually um, make a hole about as deep as the plug is tall so that this will be flush with the soil surface. I can take off the cotyledon leaves and plant it right like that. This is red loose leaf lettuce. So this is a type of lettuce that you can just cut the top of and then it'll grow back. And I am not hesitating really to fill up the bed with mostly greens because these are greens that when we get into the summer and it's time to plant our eggplants and our peppers and our summer fruiting crops, the bok choy and the lettuce and the radishes that we're going to seed will be up. Um, it'll be about too hot for them and we will have harvested most of them already. So it'll be a good transition period in the garden. This is 
another variety of lettuce, um, but green. So I think they're a nice balance, the red and the greens. Um, then when we harvest them, then we'll have a more colorful salad. And these are red ace beets. They're really nice, deep purple color. And their roots are, I think, really pretty. They're very pink. And these are going to go in here. Now we're gonna get into the direct seeding crops. And the first up is going to be nasturtiums. These are really beautiful, edible flowers. These will be a really bright orange. And they are actually really good at attracting aphids and working as a biological control for pests in the garden. And so I'm going to put these right at the front uh, because this variety is called trailing nasturtium, so they'll kind of like to hang over. So I'm gonna make a row, a nice little divot here at the side of my hand. And just like the sugar snap peas, I'm just gonna drop them in. These don't have to be perfectly spaced in a row, um, but I think it just kind of makes everything easier. Um, I made two rows like this and I'm just going to cover them about an inch deep. Next step is our Easter egg radish and it's called Easter egg because they're different colors. They're purple and pink and white. So it's pretty cool. And again, these I am going to make, um, it is a bit more important their spacing because we want them to grow full size and get a good harvest out of them. And if we don't thin them, um, they'll be really small. So having said that it's important to space out the radishes, the seeds are also really small. So it's pretty hard to do, especially, you know, with soil all over your hands. So what I like to do is I like to sprinkle them, be mindful that I want them spaced out and then make sure I go back in about two weeks after they've germinated and thin them. And whenever I thin them, I pinch out crowded sprouts um, and I just pinch out of the soil so that the spacing is about one every inch. And I kind of just zipper up the dent I made and cover them. And another thing I wanted to try to plant right now is beans. I love green beans and these are a really cool variety. They're called dragon tongue. And the green bean is white and it has purple flame-like designs, so I think it's fun. And I'm just going to plop these in, one or two in a hole, like that. And lastly, I would like to try some Malbar spinach. Malbar spinach is the climbing spinach, so like our sweet snap peas, it'll really get really tall and it's a really neat texture. So I'm just going to do a little bit right on the side here so we can see. Another good thing about the spinach is that it's really heat tolerant. So our standard spinach that we usually see at the grocery store that we usually find at the gardening store doesn't like the heat um, but this small bar spinach can grow well into the summer so all right so we have planted in our beds which is awesome all we have left to do is to label them and 
a new thing that I'm doing that I really like is sprinkling kelp meal around the transplants. And kelp meal also has really awesome micronutrients that's really good for the plants that the plants uptake really quickly. Um, so this is a great boost to kind of support them, support the transplants uh, that might be feeling a bit stressed out right going into the soil. So I'm just going to sprinkle these around them, but I'm not going to incorporate into the direct seeded stuff because by the time those seeds germinate, this stuff will have already really been uptaken in the soil. I remember we said planting garlic is an exercise in faith. Garlic is like a great exercise in faith <laughs> because each single clove was planted three inches deep and in the spring it starts to sprout and so all of our garlic did in fact sprout which is great and we will watch it grow keep observing it until july and then in july it'll grow a garlic scape and we'll harvest those and that will tell us in about two weeks we're ready to pull out the garlic and you know if the garlic hadn't done as well well we can't plant garlic in the spring but luckily uh it did well <laughs> this is sage that is really impressive it's already full um we pruned it in the fall but right away it's come back really well our beds have been awakened for the spring and that's how we do our first spring planting <laughs> <laughs>